look at a case first. This is a 32-year-old male who had placenta angina for two months and some T inversion in 2-3 AVF. Echo showed normal early function, but he wasn't able to perform any of his daily activity without angina. And this is what his angiogram showed us. This is the left circulation. Just I think your circulation. slides are not moving. All right, sir. Are they visible now? Yes, they are good. Yeah. So this is the 32-year-old male with crescendo angina. Not much significant risk factor. This is his left circulation. And uh, this is another couple of views of the left circulation. And this was his right circulation. So one can make out that this is a um, two-segment disease of the RCA. Proximal RCA has got an eccentric tubular lesion that is about 90% with an osteal PD disease. And the LED has osteal 100% stenosis with an ambiguous proximal cap. At the time the diagnostic was finished, he had a little bit of bradycardia, so temporary pacemaker was in and the Lima shot was done. We also did a CT angiogram to see whether there was any course visible of the proximal LED, but as one can see, I've just taken the representative images. There's absolutely nothing seen. You can't see the stump of the LED at all, but you can see that the rest of the LED is filling quite well later. This is another 56 year old male, hypertensive with dyslipidemia, chronic stable angina, recent worsening and walking just 200 meters. It refused bypass surgery and referred to us center for revas and this is what his anatomy was like a large dominant circumflex with an osteal cto an om3 with some 70 percent disease co-dominant rca which was proximally occluded there's a 53 year old lady with chronic stable angina for three years and now crippled angina for three months she refused all intervention and this is what her angiogram was like the right absolutely free from disease but the osteal lady was completely occluded this is a fourth case so Post CABG, you can see that there is again ambiguous proximal stump and the entire LED is filling retrograde from the RCA along with the second diagonal. A CTO is the occlusion of a quaternary artery with a TME score of zero that has been there for at least three months. 20% of all patients undergoing angiograms have chronic total occlusions, and this is associated with significant morbidity and mortality. Worsening symptoms, worsening LP function, increased incidence of entry. Arrhythmias. And the USA, Italian, and Japanese national registry data show that 5 to 22 percent of all CTOs are actually treated by PCLs. The Credo Kyoto AMI registry has suggested that CTO in a non infarcted artery was associated with an increased five year mortality in STEMI in patients with multivessel disease. The mm -hmm. SCAR report says that the CTOs are associated with increased mortality, especially in patients with ACS, and even more so in patients less than 60 years of age. So why do we do a CTO? It has got increased risks and complications. Earlier studies till 2010 said that success rate was about 58 to 75 percent. But in recent times, the US, Italian, and Japanese registries have shown an 85 to 90 percent success rate with the experienced operators and diminishing complication rates. Now, is it possible for us to replicate the results? CTO PCI, if we look at observational studies, what does the theory say? Such people have fewer symptoms. They have improved quality of life and they possibly have a reduced need for coronary artery bypass surgery with a reduced reduction in ischemic burden and mortality. But what about randomized data? There are three large randomized studies, the Decision CTO, the Euro CTO, and the Explore. Now, the Decision CTO was a prospective multi-center open limit randomized trial. Bear with me, the slides are busy, but they have important messages. They plan to recruit 1,200, but recruit only 400. They compared optimal medical therapy with or without for CTO in patients with silent ischemia, stable angina, or ACS, with the primary endpoint of death, cardiac infarction, stroke, and repeat revasc, and there was no difference in the two arms. This was reported in 2017, but there are some problems with this. There was a lack of clarity regarding how many patients actually had symptoms of ischemia even after revascularization of the non-CTO lesions, whether the territory supplied by the CTO were actually viable or not at the outset of the study was not really documented. Almost 20% of crossover from the OMT arm to the PCI arm based on symptoms and um, not very well-defined criteria. A suboptimal primary endpoint. The main benefit of the CTO PCI was expected to be symptom improvement and not improvement in mortality or MI as is the case mm -hmm. for most um, percutaneous intervention. 
and a large prevalence of non CTO lesions were actually treated without knowledge of the presence of ischemia. And lastly, the trial was terminated early before the planned patients were recruited. So obviously, the power was a little limited. Randomized trial Euro CTO was CTO PCI versus OMT. Endpoint was quality of life with a 86% procedural success and a 7.6 crossover. There was a significant improvement in vagina frequency. The Explore showed randomized 304 patients to primary PCI for STEMI, and they looked at non infarct related artery CTOs and looked at CTO PCI versus medical therapy alone. They had a 73% success rate. And they tried to look at LVF and LV end diastolic volume after four months with no difference, or it wasn't very clear why a surrogate marker was used. But what about observational data? In a meta analysis of 28,486 patients in non randomized trial, successful CTO PCI is associated with low risk of death, stroke, lower CABG, less angina when compared with failed procedures. But remember, this isn't a true uh, comparison. However, they had a 71% procedural success in this data. Thus, CTO PCI is essentially for symptom relief. The overall benefit in terms of other cardiovascular events is not as strong as we'd like to believe. And the success definitely depends on operator expertise and volume. Poorer results in lower volume centers, and there is a significant learning curve to the performance of a CTO PCI. Now, we also look at scores. Why do we need a score? Essentially, this provides a quantitative measure of the likelihood of success for clinical decision making objective assessment of anatomical and clinical complexity. Score provides a template for the review of the angiogram that can be compared across centers, across countries, across volumes. It also helps you to develop a plan of how to approach the lesion, anti-grade versus retrograde, et cetera, and provide an objective for comparison of outcomes with different approaches. There are multiple CTO scores available. JCTO of Moreno et al. is the one which is most commonly used, but there are many other CTO scores. Most of of them to deal with technical success anti-grade and a few retrograde, including a CT-based scores. Now, thus, how do we choose a CTO for intervention? Does the patient need it? That means he needs to have symptoms, or at the very least, one must demonstrate reversible ischemia or viability. Number two, can it be done? Lesion complexity is graded based on the scoring system that's discussed and the operator experience as to how, how experienced the center and the operator are with that particular lesion. The last part is how to do the CTO actually, is to study the angiogram carefully, identify the strategy, ensure availability of hardware, and plan well. There are essentially two basic ways of approaching a CTO, either anti-grade or ret retrograde. And the, you know, the center of our talk is going to be today wire escalation. But there are other anti-grade approaches, the parallel wire-based, the IVUS-based approaches, the dissection and re-entry, which we'll be speaking about subsequently. The retrograde approach, which means either wire escalation, dissection and re-entry, reverse card and variations on the theme. In simple terms, this is how one approaches a CTO. Dual catheter angiography, which is absolutely important as far as every CTO is concerned. One looks at the proximal cap, the distal target, the type of interventional collaterals, the length. There is another question mark here as to the tortuosity and the amount of calcium, although that's not there. But these four criteria will help us to decide whether our primary approach is going to be anti-grade or retrograde. If we have a good gap, if we have good distal targets, interventional collaterals are not so great, and the length is less than 20 millimeters, one could go primarily anti-grade. And of this, the base of all approaches is the wire escalation that we're going to discuss. The others, if the lesion length is long, there's a lot of tortuosity, dissection and re-entry with or without cross pause and stingray, and retrograde approaches that shall be discussed subsequently. There are other approaches as well, parallel wire and IVUS guided techniques, but uh, they are merit talks on their own. The four stages of learning CTO PCI, the basis of all CTO PCI is anti-grade wire escalation, which are mostly anti-grade. And thereafter, we progress to stage three and four, where one uses anti-grade and retrograde, and retrograde via bypass grafts, as well as epicardial collaterals, which carry their own degree of learning curve, as well as expertise and uh, problems. Let's come back to our cases. This is a 32-year-old male who had crescendo angina with normal LV function. This is what the diagnostic was. And one can make out that there is a very, very ambiguous proximal cap. So after finishing with the RCA PCI, we were actually planning for a hybrid approach for retrograde. And the reason why we look at proximal cap ambiguity is like this. If the ostium is stenosed, there could possibly be three ways in which this vessel is supposed to be connected to this. Now, the approaches 
these are either one uses an iwas to puncture this proximal cap identify where it is and then negotiate our way use a retrograde knuckle wire that means come back retrograde knuckle it back here and then connect these two or use an i um, use some other approach to try and get in retrograde sometimes for an osteolytic is difficult because if one creates a hematoma there one ends up occluding the circumflex as well in case the lesion is long iwas guided and balloon assisted subintimal entry are possibilities coming back to our case is our plan was to prepare for anti grade and retrograde and attempt anti grade and if required to switch that's what we did when we started we looked at bilateral injections in multiple views which we had already done earlier and started with our cto pci when we looked at the lao cordal there appeared to be a small tiny stump and that's what we started with this is an xtr followed by an xta and we were able to to intubate the proximal possibly the proximal mouth of the cto and the wire would however keep going into some branch now we weren't really sure whether it was the correct course so far but it appeared to be all right so then we took the risk of advancing the microcatheter gently and switching the wire to a different and a more penetrating wire checked in different views no anti grade injections are usually given at this stage once we reached the distal cap or somewhere close to the body we actually switched to a gaia third and we were able to therefore cross thereafter although we were ready for a retrograde approach as well it went into the diagonal but it could easily be redirected into the lad balloon dilatation and then balloon trapping and then we exchanged for workhorse wire and finished the case with two long stents there was also disease at the osteolytic so we stented into the left main and then finished with an oct and that's what the oct showed us our results were perfectly acceptable and the patient continues to be asymptomatic more than a year after his angioplasty his stress mpi is absolutely normal now we had also done a check angiogram of the rc at that time this was our second patient the 56 year old male with hypertension and dyslipidemia chronic stable angina worsening this is what he had a distal 70% stenosis of the disc left main with an led osteal cto this was a little tricky because the angle was more than the 90 degrees and this was in the days before the gaia wires were available so we had access only to the other workhorse or rather the other cto wires so that's what we did after we managed to put in the cto wire up to here it wouldn't move so we did a small dilatation with a 1.25 balloon and then put in another wire alongside it and we were able to cross along with the microcatheter and then finished with the bifurcation dk crash of the left main that's what our final result was our 53 the old lady with dyslipidemia we have then crossed anti grade because they could see a small channel and then finished stenting from the left main to the led crossover and this is a follow up after 11 months with the oct follow up this is our fourth case who again had the proximal ambiguous proximal cap this is the bilateral injection in multiple views again one can see that it is not very clear but in the caudal view we were able to see a small track for a proximal cap initial wiring as you see is with the xtr and then changed over to the xta the wire went into the diagonal and we weren't very unhappy because we had crossed the cto segment so we managed to put the micro catheter into the diagonal changed to a workhorse wire dilated the cto segment gently and then the workhorse wire easily passed into the distal led without any problem and then we finished the case in the conventional fashion and that was our final result this is another 63 year old male with chronic stable angina for 2 years and recent worsening with 50 meter exertion distance this is what his left circulation was like again again one could see an ambiguous proximal cap however there was a small stump in the ap caudal view and we were able to intubate that cross in exchange for a workhorse wire and finish and finish with an lm led crossover this is what we ended up with these were our oct pictures this is another patient who had undergone pci at a civil center the lady had got dissected during the angioplasty and they ended up stenting the whole body of the lt from the distal led up to the left main the patient had a dominant circumflex that actually got occluded there after when he came back to us with crescendo angina and one can see in the non dominant rca filling the entire retro um, by retrograde fashion the entire dominant circumflex right up to the ostium luckily we had very good visualization so after we finished the depth to the isr of the distal led we were able to wire with the cto wire 
dilate proximally, put in a wire, and then finished with a culotte into this. Thus, the approach to a candidate for anti-grade wire escalation. Selection is after doing a bilateral injection, one must have a favorable or a good proximal cap, a true CTO length, ideally less than 20 millimeters, a good distal target visualized in at least one projection, a clear definition of tortuosity and calcium, and a landing zone that's very, very well seen. Now, this isn't always possible. And we've tried to show you exceptions to all these in the lesions that we've shown. But as a, in the initial part of CTO um, work, these are the important questions that should be answered when one opts for an anti-grade wire escalation technique. Now, what about the guide catheter? The guide catheter must afford us support and it must also give an axis of approach. The micro catheter that one uses are now very, very good and excellent quality tapered micro catheters. That is the Corsair Pro are available. Corsair and Corsair Pro are available. There are also dual lumen catheters and bent catheters, which can be used subsequently. The uh, Kaneka dual lumen catheter, the, um, no, the twin pass and the crusade. The crusade is the Kaneka one. The wires, which are workhorse, polymer with low penetration, that is XTR and XTA. And the CTO wires are the penetrating wires of the Gaia family and the higher penetration wires, the progress, the miracle, the confianza. So essentially the approach remains to use a micro catheter try and cross with the micro catheter over a wire, exchange it for a workhorse wire and finish. Now, this is how one does it. If one looks at anti-grade, if the lesion length is less than 20, we first start with a tapered tip wire, that is the Fielder XTR, XTA family. Thereafter, switch to a non-penetrative tip, then use the highly penetrative tip if required, if one has to come back into the true lumen, if there is some difficulty with the usual penetrative tip wires, Try and de-escalate as fast as possible one, when once one gets access to the distal vessel and then put in the micro catheter over it, put in the workhorse wire and then finish. These are the four families of wires for the anti-grade wire escalation. The tapered tip wire, which is the fielder XT, the XTA, the XTR, the Boston also makes fighter and the teleflex, which is not available in India. These are the wires which are usually first used to track a micro, micro channel. The non-tapered hydrophilic tip, which we don't use in our lab most of the while, we switch from the tapered tip directly to the penetrative tip. That is our preferred option. We use the Gaia first, second, or third, depending on the lesion. It, although it says if the course of the vessel is short or well understood, most of the time the Gaias are extremely uh, torqueable, even in the body of the chronic total occlusion. And one is usually able to torque them into the area of interest and back into the true loom. Uh, you know, if, if one is careful. The highly penetrative tip are used in case one doesn't have any angulation and one has a clear idea of where one needs to go. That is the Confianza and the Miracle Brost, 12 millimeters, 12 grams. Now, I've taken this slide from the Asahi because this single wire is the one which has probably changed the success of CTO PCI, at least in our labs and in our hands. These are the basic Gaia family of wires has a non-coated tapered tip, a coil length of 150, and then a slip coat for about 40 centimeters from the uh, up to the back. So this allows it to walk through whatever are our penetrative. It gives you a combination of penetration and torqueability into the substance of the CTO. And one is able to torque this wire in whatever direction one wants, even in the substance of the CTO. The tip loads are given here. 1.7 for the first, 3.5 for the second, and 4.5 for the third. But remember, with the micro catheter, this can even be more destructive, and thus they need to be taught very, very carefully. When they can be redirected within the occluded lumen, the rotational force within the lesion can be transmitted very easily, and it has the ability to change direction when the rotational force of the wire exceeds the lesion resistance. It can transmit one is to one rotation from proximal to distal, even in higher resistance areas in bends and occlusions. The other issues as far as anti-grade wire escalation are concerned is die limit. That means one must not exceed 3.5 times the EGFR unless one is absolutely close to the end. Radiation limit, again, five grays. Operator fitting, usually three hours in our lab, but it changes. Any single approach for more than 30 minutes with no progress, I wouldn't even wait 30 minutes. Probably one has to change approach, especially in the intermediate level of seniority as we are. And if unsuccessful, consider investing 
investment, consider an investment procedure and come back at a later date. Some other case examples I've got for wiring challenges. This is a patient in whom one can actually see a small stump and one was able to put the wire into that segment, but we can see that there is a sharp angulation between the distal body of the CTO and where we need to go. So the wire would repeatedly prolapse into the septal and it was extremely difficult to put it into the distal LED, into the uh, uh, distal part of the CTO. So what we did was we put in a U-bend. We didn't have a dual lumen microcatheter at that time. And you can see that we've used an XTR with a very sharp bend, managed to put it over the microcatheter after leaving a workhorse wire beyond the CTO through the microcatheter, left it at the distal bend, brought the microcatheter to what we used to be called the power position, managed to turn it the other way, and then pushed the wire in and managed to put it in. And that's what we finished with, a perfectly good result. Another important thing is to enhance support and important to change the guide, choose the guide well in the first place. In this patient, we actually didn't choose the guide well. We started with a JR and we we were, however, somehow able to cross, but we couldn't, the vessel was, I mean, the lesion was quite calcified. There was a clear proximal cap and a good stump, so one was able to cross, but we're not able to get any balloon down beyond this calcified uh, fluid segment. So we changed to an AR. So this is quite a simple step that one brings the guide back into the aorta, puts in an O35 Teflon into the aorta, and over that changes to an AR. And thus we were able to push in a balloon very easily beyond with an AR. Uh, and able to finish the case quite comfortably after putting a 1.25 balloon and then serially dilating thereafter. Another patient who's post CABG RCA CTO again, similar approach that <clears throat> we're able to start initially with an XTR microcatheter and then switch to penetrative wire and cross into the distal RCA. But again, we weren't able to track any balloon beyond this. And we had already changed to a support guide at this stage. This was, we were already in an implants. So we opted to put in a, the balloon wouldn't track beyond the CTO segment. So we put in a anchoring balloon into the RV branch. And now you can see that the CTO balloon will come quite easily and it crosses where we needed to cross very easily and we were able to finish the case. This is another patient with a long calcified LAD CTO. You can see that the retrograde filling is just up to the distal LED. The whole calcified segment was rather difficult to cross, but we did manage to cross with microcatheter and put in a Gaia third into the distal LED. But the balloon wouldn't go until we enhanced support with the guideline. And you can see the guideline which we've tracked up to here. And then after that, we were able to finish the case. Thereafter, putting in the balloon, microcatheter, workhorse wire, and finishing angioplasty of this LED. This is another patient with a proximal LED CTO. All of them, the principles remain the same, that one uses a tapered tip hydrophilic wire, which will easily bend and, and will not try not to dissect with it. You can see a very, very clear stump in the proximal LED in the anti-grade injection and retrograde. So the CTO segment is about 15 to 20 millimeters long. They're easily able to put a small XTR along with the microcatheter, gently negotiate the microcatheter up to the proximal end of the CTO, exchange for a more penetrative wire, pull out the XTR and put it in a more penetrative wire, and then gradually negotiate this wire beyond the substance of the CTO into the distal LED and finish the case. Now, what next? Parallel wire dissection, re-entry, and retrograde techniques, which are going to be spoken of in the next talks. This is an example of retrograde. The 10 steps to CTO approach, there are four, as far as any CTO is concerned. First step is the dual angiogram. Second is a careful angiographic review, focusing on the proximal cap, the morphology, the occlusive segment, the distal vessel quality, and collateral circulation. Approach the proximal cap ambiguity uh, international recommendation are using ultrasound, ultrasound if one has a side branch, using retrograde if one is not sure where the proximal cap is, and move the cap techniques using scratch and go, which I haven't spoken of because they're not out of the course of our 
anti-grade wire escalation techniques today. Poor distal quality, as we've spoken of, uses the retrograde approach and bifurcation of the distal cap, again by use of a dual lumen catheter and intravascular ultrasound. Retrograde crossing through graft, septal, and epicardial collateral vessels whenever possible. Anti-grade wiring strategies that we've spoken of. The retrograde approach changed the strategy when failing to achieve. Consider performing an investment procedure if all crossing attempts fail and important mm -hmm. to stop when reaching radiation, contrast, procedural time, operator fatigue limits. These are the various algorithms which are there. The hybrid Asia Pacific CTO, Euro CTO, CTO Club China, Japan CTO and global. And there isn't so much of great difference in them except in the retrograde techniques which are preferred by one group or the other group or dissection and re-entry, which the Europeans don't really like, and the Americans are very, very fond of. This depends on experience and local expertise. In summary, CTO-PCI, the major target is symptom improvement. If it's asymptomatic, we must document viability and ischemia before putting the patient on the table and target an improvement in EF, especially in a, say, a proximal LED CTO, in case the patient does have some LV dysfunction. Estimate the likelihood of success using the various scoring systems available. Estimate a risk of complication. Make a plan and therefore succeed. Thank you for your attention and I should be glad. I hope there'll be lots of discussion. Thank you, sir. And thank you for finishing very early so that we can have a lot more time for discussion and here to the grades that we have here today. So everything is with uh, Dr. Bali, Dr. Parley and I hope Dr. Rao is also here, at least with his audio. Meanwhile, sir, allow me to just share my screen so that uh, the group, uh, the link that allows us uh, discussion is uh, projected. We can carry on the discussion in uh, meanwhile, sir. I think, Ajay, excellent talk as uh, always. And you made a very complicated uh, procedure very simple to look at. A uh, few points which I'd like to uh, discuss with you and uh, take uh, discussion forward. Very rightly uh, pointed out that the first and foremost is that we should study the angiogram very clearly to see what is going on. How is the uh, tip like and uh, what's the length of it and uh, what is the direction calcium and all those uh, scores which we talk about. Uh, one thing is uh, very rightly said we need a dual uh, catheters, uh, do uh, two catheters, one integrate and retrograde to see how the collaterals are coming. And guide sport is absolutely essential and that should be decided right at the bit. Uh, I, I don't like uh, changing in the middle of the procedure, so I think you should be, one should be very comfortable uh, having a guide catheter in place. Second point which I'd like to make is that uh, uh, you, we, we talked about escalation and this is what we normally talk of CTO, wire escalation. But uh, that has probably been uh, now replaced. You are reasonably certain what, how, how your wire is going to be. And in almost 80 to 85% of your cases, you can take a workhorse uh, horse, uh, wire, uh, take the micro catheter and shift on to Gaia family and cross the lesion. And rarely you would have to go to other Gaia 3 or uh, Conquest Pro or Confianza or other wires. So I think wire escalation, when you are talking about, uh, we should be clear that it does add to the cash factor, to the uh, cost factor. And uh, we need to limit the number of wires which we use. And uh, there's no need to go through the field of series when the stump is not good or it's a uh, hard lesion and the fielder is not going to give you. So you go with the uh, uh, your workhouse wire, whichever is road, road runner or whatever, your EMW or whatever, take a micro cutter, cross it, take a your micro cutter and change it to workhouse and finish the procedure. The one point which I would like to make is that uh, the problem which comes in CTO, uh, most of the young people which I've seen, is, I think uh, your movement of the wire is extremely important. Uh, where your wire is going. And these wires which we are using are very stiff wires, they're, they're stiff uh, tip. And when we are tackling the lesion, the length of the CTO, the feel is different than when you are in the normal uh, segment. And many times I've seen that uh, you know, the, the same amount of force or other thing is used and you cross the lesion and when you're in a normal segment, it may go through the, the normal vessel and produce a perforation. So you should be very clear about gently hand, uh, handling this uh, 
CTO wise, that is one part. Uh, other factors you have very uh, rightly highlighted that you might need a guideliner to have an excess, or you might need an anchoring wire or an anchoring balloon. Uh, Sometimes you may need a, uh, another balloon there to give support to your. Uh, but what I generally do not like is you know balloon giving support to your guide wire. Uh, that is very commonly used by many operators. I feel that once you use a balloon to give support to your wire, uh, one that you lose control over tip of your wire, and number two is you raise the grams at that wire tip almost by ten times. If it is within maybe about uh, five millimeters of the wire, you have gone to ten times, and if you got even two millimeters of the wire, you have gone almost uh, maybe even higher than that. So I I don't think that's a good way to go about it. Uh, other than that. I would feel that a beautifully covered lecture and uh, then we can take each step and discuss it further. Uh, the question which I would li like to ask is that how important is getting a CT? Uh, do you get your CT done prior to your every CTO being done? Uh, do you get it only in those cases where you're not clear about uh, your tip or your uh, uh, proximal cap or you're not clear about the length of the uh, occluded vessel? What is the uh, what is your take on CT before I, uh, take, taking any patient for a CT at the cost? Thank you very much for all the comments. Are absolutely perfect. We have abandoned balloon support about eight, ten years ago. We do not use it anymore. Microcatheters are uh, the way to go as far as any CT or PCI is concerned. The first wire that one uses as far as possible is always a workhorse. Unfortunately, the examples which I have chosen are all those in which the CTO segment was very, very, very close to the austere. So we started with a microchannel tracking wire. But if one is working in the mid LED, one will always use any workhorse wire. And sometimes one will be surprised the workhorse with the microcatheter might actually do the job. We might not even need to. Because whatever you say, there are so many questions which need to be answered. Sometimes the workhorse itself will cross. But uh, having said that, if the lesion length is longer than 10 millimeters, we will always try to track with a, uh, with a, you know, with a micro channel wire. And if that doesn't work, then we switch to the Gaia without any uh, hesitation whatsoever. I feel it is the Gaia which has actually changed the way in which we have approached CTO. Absolutely. They can have a different level in time. The point about wire movement that sir made is absolutely, I don't know how it cannot be overemphasized. If one does not do any drilling any further, the Gaia family of wires has shown that a 90 degree turn in one direction and then the other, the wire moves exactly as much as one's hands moves with the torter and you are easily able to direct and push and the use of both hands to move the wire forward is another technique which we use use in our lab. Others, as you build experience, you will make what you want. The point about cost, sir, made is absolutely perfect. And um, the other thing which I should have said was de-escalation. It's not only escalation, it's also de-escalation. In fact, the moment one crosses the CTO segment, it is important to try and get the microcatheter into a position where you are able to remove your CTO wire and always change with a workhorse wire. I, I tried to show that step in some of the cases which we did, but we do it in every patient. Only if the microcatheter is not able to cross, do we actually use a small balloon to make a space, never use a balloon, and we do not complete CTOs on um, work on CTO wires at all. They will always be exchanged for workhorse wire. The point about CT, sir, we use the CT only in case the proximal cap is ambiguous. Like all operators or fearful operators like us, we will don't like to go retrograde without a plan. And sometimes the CT surprises us because it is able to show that the course is a little more tortuous than we think. I mean, in the example, I picked that particular example because it was about a 30 millimeter long CTO segment and about 20 millimeters could not be seen at all on the CT scan in multiple views, but still we were able to track with a micro channel in spite of not being able to see. And uh, there are certain RCAs in which the tortuosity actually is a little more than what one expects. One just sees the proximal stump and we see it reforming somewhere beyond the marginal branch. And we have absolutely not much idea of the clue. You can see some islands of calcium if you're lucky, but many times you can't. And that tortuosity is sometimes picked up very, very well on the CT scan. 
especially in case the proximal stump is ambiguous. Even when the proximal stump is good, if the lesion length is very long, sometimes the CT is extremely helpful. Even if you're not able to pick up the course, one can see islands of calcium and uh, with good work with the radiologist, one is able to make out which angle is best. So in patients with long segment occlusions and in patients who have ambiguous proximal caps, we will try and do a CT scan. If it, it's not always possible, but if it's possible, it sometimes helps a great deal. That's what I would say about CT. I won't do it for every patient, sir. Maybe two out of 10 CTOs. Am I audible, uh, Dr. Ajay? Yes, yes, sir. Please go. Uh, so very nice talk, very impressive and anti-grade. I think uh, in 2012, when I do a start uh, initially, uh, I think Gaia made a big change in our uh, approach because most of the case we used to switch over to retrograde but a robust anti-grade uh, approach is now followed. I think still everybody should practice anti-grade in the beginning, you know, whatever tough, unless it is a retry within short time. Because retry should always give a gap of uh, 8 weeks to 12 weeks minimum. Uh, uh, then uh, if you want to try a, a case within that period, only a retrograde approach, if you try anti-grade. Another very important thing uh, that... Uh, we don't, we did not get Gaia next, but uh, I happened to use these whites, Gaia next and Gladius and all these whites. They further improve the success rate anti-rate. Now, almost it costs 90% in most of the experienced uh, hands. And uh, another important thing that never give, never give for a newcomer anti-rate injection at any time. So only coronate technique when you want to give a uh, fine process in just a small 0.5 ml, rarely, very rarely, uh, when you fail in all other techniques, that's the only technique we use. That's the only occasion, never give anti-grade injections. And as long as you don't give uh, injections, you can continue the process uh, safely. That's what uh, we enter. So the, uh, I think it's a very excellent talk. Uh, uh, yeah, a long segment uh, CTOs, calcium. These are the areas uh, where I think we have to go for a CT beforehand and somebody failed a CTO, well, what is the reason we want to find? Then uh, I think CT definitely guides in ambiguous cap areas. And I was usage as yes, practically, I have done many cases, I, almost 1400 CTOs last, uh, I think 14 years. But uh, practically speaking, I was guided puncture, talking is easy, but practically there are many issues in the I was guided puncture. Even use uh, I was, the way you handle the wire uh, and the angiographic correlation is very important. Unless it's a very bad awkward angle, uh, you have to puncture with a crusade catheter, as you see, shown a good number of cases in a stump, pastel stump thing. IVAS may guide you, but it's a combination of your angiographic views and the IVAS. It's not just IVAS guided. That's what I feel. So, uh, overall, it's an excellent presentation. Thank you. Excellent. Happy to see my teacher, Dr. Bali. Uh, I, 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 just, and, uh, I just I still love remember that how he used to guide us in me. all difficult situations. Sorry, sir, I could not meet you. I happened to do some cases in PJ recent, but I could not meet you. Next time, I will come and meet you, sir. Yeah, I keep on hearing about a lot about you, and it would have been a pleasure meeting you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, Ajay, uh, the two other points which uh, one needs to discuss is that you may cross the wire. And uh, how do you know that you are, one is the angiographic uh, picture that you are in the true human. And second is uh, uh, wire movement. That it is in the true human. We need to be very clear about it. One area is that you may cross with the region which happens more often and you may not be able to cross with any building. Wire crossable, balloon not crossable region, and did mention about taking the guide liner and near about using one millimeter balloon, one point two five, and all that. Any other technique would you like to talk about? So there, wire has crossed with a, uh, your uh, CTO wire. The balloon is not available. So um, most of the time, uh, most important is to try and identify why this is happening. 
If this is happening because of tortuosity or because of calcium, then the answers are different. If it is happening because of poor guide support, then the answer is different. If it is happening because sometimes even the wire gets kinked at that time and you can just move it forward and back and you might be able to do it. Most usually the cause is that there is this little speck of calcium and a little bit of tortuosity. Most of the time, these uh, the Gaia wires are extremely good. And if you manage to get them across, the ability to deliver a balloon is very, very good. The problem is only guide support. And um, you know, once the wire is across, the option of tornus works in a fibrotic and a tortuous lesion, but tornus doesn't work with calcium. So the, the other options are like uh, we used to like the earlier Lumen front runner, run, runner type things that you jam the balloon into the CTO segment as much as it will go with the help of the liner. Pardon me? The nidoplastic. Yeah, yeah. No, don't have to rupture the balloon. So you can dilate it. Inflate it. And yes, dilate it, inflate it, get the guideliner forward in more and then try and track the balloon as far as possible. Then, uh, then next, of course, remains grenadoplasty that one takes in the balloon and ruptures it. Make sure that it's not a very large balloon. It's a 1.25. Most of the time, it will modify the plaque enough for us to be able to deliver something else, although that is a butcher's way of doing it, and I wouldn't really like that. But uh, And the last option always remains that uh, one can do, if you're sure that you're in the true lumen, there are four patients in the last year in whom I have actually done a rotablation, and one is able to take the microcatheter, especially the newer microcatheters. The Corsair Pro is a fabulous catheter. And if one is sure that you have crossed mostly where the CTO segment is, most of the time it happens when there's a small bend beyond the CTO and the balloon is not able to cross there. If one is able to jam the microcatheter in place, one can usually take a stainless steel rota wire and do a small, simple rotablation and um, get away. But for that, one has to be really sure that one is not true, false, true. Because if that happens, then sometimes it creates a more problem than bigger problem than it solves. And usually use only a 1.25 bar. So these are my three options. First is a tornus in case the one millimeter. And now the newer one, one millimeter balloon of Vure is another fabulous option. I think it is where the wire goes, this balloon goes. It's extremely good. Enhance support, use the smallest balloon, use the guide liner, use the micro catheter, try and replace it if you want with a supportive wire, use an anchoring balloon, grenadoplasty. And um, I think now probably with, with a combination of this, if the wire is in the distal true lumen, it is very unlikely that one will not be able to do something to modify the lesion enough for us to get some hardware across. Enough to put the microcatheter across, then we are absolutely fine. You put in the wire and you rotablate it and then come back out. But as I said, only four patients in the last two years that we've required to do this. So it's not really so, so much of an issue with the new hardware. This used to be a problem about four or five years ago. I mean, one would cross and then we would have difficulty, but the guideliner has made a big difference. The newer balloons have made a big difference. So, but I should be glad for contest from anybody else. I, I think two points uh, which I'd like you to take up or Dr. Surya to take up. One is that the message which should go to uh, every young interventionist is that Many people believe that it's a CTO that it can't become worse. It can't produce any side effect. So I may not, at the end, I may not succeed. But that factor must be made very clear that you can have devastating complications while doing a CTO. That's one part of it. And second part is, you did not touch about that in your uh, lecture, that uh, managing complications of a CTO, whether it's a perf, a micro perf, or a normal vessel perf, or, uh, you know, guide uh, catheter induced osteal uh, dissection or the collaterals from the other side being blocked. Uh, managing that, these are also part of a CTO protocol. And your, cabin, your cabinet must have all these uh, uh, your hardware available to tackle all the anticipated complications. And sometimes, uh, although that's more common in retrograde, yeah. you may have an intramural nematoma, which could be, uh, may produce a problem, what we call as a uh, dry tamponade or other things. So I think uh, anticipating a complication, knowing when complication has occurred and how to manage those complications is part of a CTO uh, and the plastic protocol as well. And one should do that. Yes. 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 But yes. out of all uh, the Tajai uh, uncrossable lesions, I think practically more useful are the guideliners recent days and the one millimeter balloon. 
and the tornus. I think uh, these three things really help us in most of the cases. And uh, now I think uh, the laser also, uh, you can use the 0.9 millimeter laser for this in some of the cases we have done and uh, very useful. Maybe coming years will play a major role in these uh, uncrossable regions. I think what I learned is that uh, laser, will be, uh, although Summit has probably more experience on that, laser will be very useful in mild to moderate calcification. It's very heavy calcification probably, laser may not be that uh, effective. Are there complications and CTO and message? Right, sir. Uh, my topic for today was anti-grade wire escalation. And in this, essentially, there are uh, one complication which uh, you can prevent what uh, Dr. Prakash Rao said. I noted down that point. Anti-grade injections are a strict no-no. One never does an anti-grade injection at all. Because if one, even if the water... We're talking of anti-grade micro not only micro anti-grade injection, once one is in the substance of the CTO and that's trying to cross. But what guide cuts is not, not an issue. No, guide. The local side, local side injection. Yes, yes, absolutely. So micro catheter injections are, uh, you know, no longer done, you know, because one has retrograde of uh, very, very good. Anti-grade virus escalation essentially is for patients who have got very, very good distal targets. And you're absolutely sure as to where you're going to put the CTO wire into which branch or into which territory, which direction one is going to push the CTO wire. So one definitely has a very clear target. It is not a wire or fishing expedition where you take a wire and start hunting for where it is. So we have a very clear idea of where it is to go. So the retrograde injection is what guides the, um, I'll, the I'll, I will, I will, I will take it a little away from uh, this area. You know, we talk about bilateral injection. I think that's true for the first 100, 200 cases of yours. But uh, I think 80% of your CTO angioplasty, you can finish only by the radial route. You have an angiogram. You have done an angiogram from the uh -huh. other side. You, that acts as a radial route. Your wire movement tells you that in, you are in two lumen. And I'm making a statement which may, you know, it's like a uh, slow, <laughs> slow left arm. On, but, so you may not need a bilateral injection in a large majority of patients. Uh, where we what we are talking here today of 20 millimeter length CTO or things like that. We're not talking of very long segment region. And with experience in most of your cases, 80%, I would say, a radial route is good enough to take care of your CTO. Uh, uh, that's what I do these days. So, what means, uh, sure you will have a, uh, some intraconary collaterals also giving faint feeling of the distal vessel. That possibility is there. Uh, but uh, your success rate definitely, and you can finish the case fast if you have a contralateral other side injection. Definitely, so it makes a big difference. That's a very short segment CTO with some bridging collaterals and filling the distal vessel, good sized vessel. A simple radial route uh, helps you to finish the case. But uh, your safety and confidence level definitely increases if you get a contralateral injection. So, yeah, you have an angiogram, you have a diagnostic angiogram. And you have a retrograde. You got a roadmap. You can use a roadmap and do it. But you see, once you are into the false lumen, there's a mess up of things. Sometimes it can give you a very cakewalk like thing, but it's not like that. You will get into false lumen also very with these wide cytophilic. You don't know where we we'll land in. And that's and what I'm saying. The first, first 200 cases is good enough. If the, if the retrograde is not good, always unsafe a CTO. If you get a retrograde vessel, we can play anything good sized and retrograde. Surya, I am very fond of telling a cricketing story on that. <laughs> okay. You know, there was, a match, there was a match going on uh, in county cricket and Majid Khan was batting. Yes, I knew. And somebody you were discussing, you know, English players are very fond of technique and the copybook style and everything. And they said, you know, you can't play good cricket without footwork. And Majid Khan was a very reclusive cricketer. And he just, in a very low voice, he said that footwork is not important in betting. And they said, we give you a hundred pounds and you have to prove that footwork is not important. And next day, without moving his foot, he scored a century before lunch. So, <laughs> I would say the first 200 cases, maybe retrograde injection is useful. But after the, you have learned your wire, after you have learned the movement of your wire and you can feel the wire and you know that what is true lumen and what is a false lumen and what how it is 
movement of that, uh, I think in a large majority of patients, I'm not saying 100%, but in a large majority of patients, uh, you can use this. Uh, and that's what the worldwide practice is uh, becoming now, that you can go because almost all people have shifted to radio. So you go by the radio, use the roadmap, and go ahead and do it. So is not agreeing with that. <laughs> very much. They are built to just play with us. <laughs> Only if one is Majid Khan can one, you know, play without moving his feet. It is possible, but uh, you know, everybody is not. Uh, it is a lesson that we relearn. I think. Before. I think the two points is probably overrated. CQ angioplasty is probably overrated. Uh, I, I think if you study your angiogram quite well, and uh, you you know the where the western direction is, and you can. Uh, 50% uh, of the angioplasties I see is probably not CTO than angioplasties. Okay, you mentioned about three months and people talk about six months and all that. Now, every occluded vessel is a CTO vessel. <laughs> so one is which we, we, we're talking about actual uh, CTO vessel uh, angioplasty. And uh, therefore, uh, the, uh, in, in, I think in an experienced hand, it's probably overrated. And you would have... Uh, Surya mentioned about the success rate of 90%. I think in many good hands these days, that success rate is positive. Uh, I'm talking of anti-grade. I'm not talking of retrograde as, as, as yet. And uh, if your choice of case is good, and uh, even 40 millimeter long. And you see many of them in post-bypass patients where the, the graft is included, and you have the nitty vessel to be done. Uh, you can do that without uh, much of a problem. Overrated CTOs. <laughs> what do you say, Surya? With your 1,400 cases, much overrated or not? <laughs> it's a true, sir, that uh, once your volume increases, your experience increases, your success rate increases. There's no doubt in it. Uh, but it is, uh, as you said, uh, by definition, CTO is different. By practical doing, CTOs are different. Uh, real CTO really troubles you. There, I think what we are telling that the retrograde injection will help you not to get into a uh, trap and uh, coming out of the trap may be difficult sometimes. That's all. Dr. Parle, what are your thoughts? I co we can't hear you. Can you unmute yourself? Hello. Hello. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Although I'm a moderator here, actually I'm a, actually a student. Because I don't have that much experience of CTOs. And uh, I've learned a lot. Now there are certain questions, uh, which is a few cases I've did CTO. Be, some I succeeded, some I failed. <clears throat> now so I have queries, how would you go about that? One is one patient of CTO LED, uh, CTO in an LED, uh, maybe 60 year old LED, I tried to do crossed with a wire, crossed with the guy wire, and subsequently crossed with a microcatheter, removed microcatheter, then inflated with 1.25 millimeter balloon. And when, when I took the shot, of course, anti I saw the vessel had rupture. Now, I didn't know at what point did the vessel rupture because retrograde injection did show that uh, it was in the true limit. Now, my question to, is, to you is, how safe is one to cross the CTO with microcatheter after the guide wire crosses? Is it safe? Because I feel probably that's what the mistake I made because the shaft of the uh, microcatheter might have uh, ruptured that delicate risk. Otherwise, the balloon was very small. Uh, there was no reason for rupture. Uh, so, for crossing the CTO before the balloon, or you don't go with microcatheter and only cross with the balloon. Ajay? Well, sir, microcatheter is very exceedingly unlikely to cause a perforation. It's not, it is very difficult to negotiate a microcatheter outside the true lumen of the vessel, even if the wire is 
the outside one has to use a great deal of force the balloon is not like that if one goes with a balloon prior to the microcatheter it is very likely that there is a balloon which has caused the damage maybe the loose tissue has collapsed on it and then we have made it larger by pushing the microcatheter through but in our practice we will always stick the microcatheter to, into the distal vessel exchange with the workhorse wire because at the time of pushing and pulling the balloon this cto wire is likely to cause more damage and dissection in the distal vessel we do it 100% of the times and it is very difficult for a microcatheter to perforate it is most likely the balloon which is perforated the microcatheter may have uncovered it sometimes the balloon goes you may have gone true true false true i mean without seeing the angiogram it is difficult to analyze this more it is very very exceedingly difficult for a microcatheter per se to perforate i mean anything is possible in cardiology as we know so but if you are definitely in the true lumen in a retrograde injection and your microcatheter is there it is still not very difficult to close and get out with a covered stent or whatever it's not really so much of an issue the problem is if one is in the pericardium already with the wire and then one has taken the micro catheter after having dilated with the balloon and the microcatheter is in the pericardium then there is a problem because then you have to figure out where you are going to close this perforation mechanism of the perforation is extreme, extremely important to try and see how has how it has been caused because i would worry that if you you said the vessel is perforated so i don't know whether it's a hematoma or it's a pre perforation treatment depends on all those things if one's wire is in the distal true lumen i mean uh, i think there is still many ways in which it can be handled i mean one need not be very very uh, you know how do you say adventurous it is quite a simple task to deliver a stent and then put in a covered stent and then close it during that time and you can tamponade the vessel in the meanwhile but the wire has to be in the true lumen and not in the pericardium for that to happen mechanism unless we see the angiogram is difficult to really make out but i have no further analysis without data Uh, Dr. Pali, you know when we're talking about the distal wire being in the true lumen, we are going by the angiography. I, I I think one should try to go into side branches and see that uh, you are actually in the true lumen. You can uh, occasionally with these uh, Gaia wires or uh, CTO heavy duty wires or where it's 20 grams or 18 gram thick load, you can go sub intimal right through the vessel quite distal, and you may be all the way into along the vessel sub endival and not in the true lumen and uh, uh, i think that is one possibility which may have happened but surya what are your talk your opinion on that no i think uh, uh, i rarely see perforation with a 1.5 mm balloon most of the times to pass uh, sub, to go sub intimal even the micro catheter ad are we keep in the sub intimal purpose to be and we dilate with a small balloon keep the i was in the sub intimal and check the true lumen false lumen these things we do regularly intentionally so unlikely uh, maybe a wire induced at the bends can cause gaia like uh, what we discussed de escalate the wire at the distal cows tortuosities and uh, when you are taking a stiff wire for the proximal cap puncture that time that the bends the wire can perforate and enter a false lumen can enter the true lumen this can happen but uh, micro catheter as you said micro catheter and uh, 1.5 mm balloon perforating uh, uh, very rare the point was in one of the webinars uh, i think dr samin sharma or someone mentioned you have to be very careful with the micro catheter when you cross the ctu you have to move it gently and take it down in a twisting manner if you just push it then perhaps you are more likely to rupture so that is one thing second thing which i would like to ask is when you said change the wire again back to worker wire now is the balloon more deliverable or stent more deliverable in the worker wire if there uh, than the uh, harder wire like uh, gaia wire So should we first balloon dilate, make adequate space, and then then go for a stenting on our on our workhorse wire, or immediately as you cross the lesion with the micro catheter you change, or the, the whether the balloon passage and inflation will be easier. I think Ajay, you would agree that first and foremost, see that if you can get the micro catheter across the CTO, oh, then change it to a uh, you know your workhorse oh, wire. The importance of that is. most importantly that uh, the tip of the uh, the guy or other wire 
when in distal vessel and we would not have control over that, that can perforate this. So change it over as, as early as possible. The question only arises if you have an uncommon situation where your micro catheter is not crossing the CPU segment and uh, whether it's because of a band or uh, calcium or whatever. In such a situation, you may do a balloon dilatation there, but uh, it can also happen that you take 1.5 millimeter balloon and it gets stuck on that segment and traps the wire also. And the entire assembly moves together. So it's a much better and an easier method to change it to the uh, workhouse wire as compared to whether the stent can be delivered easier on a workhouse wire or not. If you have an issue, issue you can take a guideline or you can take a, uh, uh, that will help you in, uh, uh, because you have dilated the segment. You can put in a buddy wire or you can take, take a guideliner to give support if uh, you need a support to put a, a stent there. So I don't think delivery of a stent should be a problem. Ajay? Yes, sir, absolutely. Uh, Gurnath said the basic reason for changing the CTO wire onto a workhorse wire is that whenever one takes a balloon in, you're going to cause the wire to go forward and come back when you deliver it over the CTO segment and come back. Now, when it is a CTO wire, by nature, it is very likely to dissect. It may not perforate, but it may dissect. And you have crossed a beautiful segment, nice CTO, and then you end up with a distal dissection. You don't have a good outflow. That is a primary reason why one crosses. Second thing, many workhorse wires actually offer a smoother <laughs> Hello, sorry. Yeah, sorry. many workhorse wires actually offer a smoother transition. When the CTO wire has been in place for some time, sometimes it gets a little kinked there, as Dr. Bali was saying. And sometimes there is a problem trying to push the balloon across, a problem trying to push any hardware across. A workhorse wire is much more easier. It is less traumatic. The tip is designed to be atraumatic. The spring coil tip is designed to be atraumatic. So it is very easy to take whatever hardware one wants, whatever strengthening maneuver one wants with a guideliner or with an additional balloon or with an additional anchoring wire. Everything is easier when the tip is atraumatic. Even if it moves forward or back a little bit, it is not going to cause so much of damage to the tip. We would always, always, always change if possible. And for changing, in case one needs to use a balloon, I would use the smallest possible balloon for the shortest possible length before trying to deliver the micro catheter and put in the workhorse wire beside, inside, I mean, for exchange. I mean, I think that's an important take-home message. I'm glad we're having this discussion. It's not like one has crossed with the CTO wire and the game is done and you just try to take a balloon and then finish the case. Very often one ends up with a dissection and the distal edge and then you end up regretting it. Maybe we should have changed it. It has happened to all of us. Everybody is saying, I don't know whether it's happened to Surya Prakash sir or not. It's definitely happened to me in our initial years when we were very excited. Yes, we have crossed. Many, we have many, many times I avoided stenting after finishing the case after four hours struggle. Looking at the distal flow, I'm not happy. I has to call back the patient if he's very stable after a couple of weeks and stent him. This happens in CTO stage, CTO PCA. Because uh, at the earliest, you should change to your uh, regular wire. And this is very important. Uh, you may forget and sometimes it slips down. When you are pushing the devices, wire may go in. Suddenly, you see a lot of things with the dedicated CTO wires. So, so once the job is finished, uh, we should take the micro down and exchange for the work class wire. It is very important. I think uh, number of techniques... Other question which... Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead, Guru. The other question which I had in the uh, uh, RCA CTO of the patients, uh, the coronary origin was not in the normal place and it was not, I was not able to hook with the amplards. So now, which are the other support catheters that you can use in the RCA CTO? Right, sir. Uh, anomalous RC sometimes problems because it is sometimes not so easy to get a guide in the right place. But this is another situation where the guideliner helps. If it is uh, from left sinus and anterior, I would use a smaller JL, JL3 with the guideliner. Usually that's very good. If it is posterior, I would use an amplarzer. And if it is high, I would use an MPA. If one is able to even get close to the ostium, the guide liner or the guide extension catheters are very good. And most of the while with that, along with a micro catheter, one is able to intubate the substance and then put in a wire into one of the side branches and anchor your guide there. 
and then finished the case but as you say it is a challenging situation without knowing the exact anatomy it is impossible to say more but there are solutions for all situations you know one could use a long sheet uh, a support sheet and sometimes the radial route actually has better guides and offers different support uh, curves which are able to better intubate i mean in on two occasions i failed femorally and actually radially we were able to get the guide to sit with where we wanted and we were able to finish the case but it's without knowing the anatomy it is impossible to say more yes i agree <laughs> for anomalous things uh, certain cases radial route for the ct was also very good in this anomalous and the uh, amplus catheters what you can do sometimes is a floating technique so if you have a subsection stump of the ct go Uh, you can just put the vacuous wire and a fine processor, something like that, which can go easily to the proximal cap. Uh, then you can uh, engage the guide. This way, you can uh, manipulate more stiffer wire. You can pass with the uh, uh, guiding and uh, something like a micro catheter. We do some of this. Are there a number of techniques are described? You know, penetrating and drilling and uh, all those things. Do you think they actually make a difference when you are uh, going through the proximal cap or? you deliberately try to use a particular technique or it is uh, it, these are only normal glitches so sir i i to be honest we used to do all those things a decade ago but i feel the new wires have changed the way in which we approach it. earlier it was to take a cross it or one of those wires and start drilling and hope for the best but i think that has changed a little bit there is a little bit of method involved that you try and put the whatever wire one uses work cost to reach the proximal cap and try and track into whatever channel one can get to reach the power position of the micro catheter one has the micro catheter in the power position thereafter using a penetrating wire like the gaia which we do not drill we generally try and uh, you know scratch i mean it's a 90 degree to and fro kind of movement and the wire will find it will not exceed i mean there's a beautiful i mean a cartoon which shows why the gaia actually moves and does not exit the vessel architecture if it is handled properly and if there is no calcium if there is calcium that is the only situation in which one has to be a little bit more careful and one has to use either the gaia next or maybe a ub6 or a little harder miracle wire even then i would only for the sorry i would use it only for the sita carry the pole where uh, actually um, required now as far as the drilling is concerned most of the time we do drilling with a tapered tip uncoated wire for distances for 10 to 20 mm and uh, if it is longer than that it is always better to do it a dissection and reentry technique because i think drilling except in very very straight segments in say the lady or in the mid rca or something i mean pretty much is abandoned now as far as our lab is concerned we used to do them to be honest we used to do them about 8 years 9 years ago when these wires were not there but we don't do much drilling anymore there is some kind of technique in trying to enter the micro channel negotiate sometimes for reentry into the true lumen when one is subintimal and one does not know then one switches to a little harder wire and there you might do for a small time drilling it's almost like an adr but only without the cross boss and stingray you use a little harder wire to try and enter into the true lumen and then follow it with a softer or a better wire one wire which we did not discuss is suo3 and it's a fantastic wire when one uses it in particular for tracking not only for retrograde i think it's an absolutely beautiful wire for use for micro tracking and uh, we are sometimes surprised by the way in which where even the harder wires don't go it is able to find the true human even in dissected and uh, seemingly tort and difficult cities so a three is one wire that sometimes gets you out of trouble if one is able to actually see where one needs to go uh one of the cases which uh, was where there was a lot of angle between and you had to take a micro catheter and jam it and then angle uh, the wire now gaia company manual says that you can't make a curve here but i have made a curve in gaia two uh, two times uh, do you feel a conquest pro uh, would be uh, the wire if the angulation is very very acute and you can make a curve in conquest pro and go ahead and the procedure or you would like to make a curve in the gap or what would you like to do so there you were able to get with a uh, feeder xt 
but if the region is hard you are not able to get the field density you are using a gaia or a compass pro an angulation what would be your go to one so sir, the difference between the two wires is gaia still gives you a modicum of control conquest pro after one to one talk one to one talk is key mm. yeah yeah gaia still gives you a little bit of control if i know where i am going i will always use the gaia and if if the gaia buckles or bends then i know it is because of calcium that is the stage when i will switch to a conquest pro in case i know that i need to go at a small angle and i know in two orthogonal projections that this is the angle i need to go and i do not succeed with the gaia because of calcium that is the one situation where i will use a compass pro basically re entry into the two lumen is my this one i don't use it in the substance of the cpu i use the compass pro only to penetrate the distal cap to get back into the true lumen in a small short segment but then inexperienced and um, you know so that is my that is my uh, technique i mean that's what i use that's what i'm comfortable with gaia i feel is still offers support and is the most torqueable and the most controllable wire in the armory even the gaia third i do not fear the gaia third and i mean it gives excellent tactile feedback it is an i mean exceedingly torqueable and very very open. so i mean it's an it's an excellent wire i don't think that it is as far as we are concerned it is the you know how do you say the go to wire when one is stuck Surya, you are experienced in making a curve on the Gaia wire. Oh, I sometimes make that. Suppose uh, there is a acute loop. I use a crusade catheter for the uh, ambiguous cap to puncture the austere locations. I make a second curve in the Gaia, uh, but uh, they don't recommend that. But practically, it's useful. I, I I did not lose the one to one torque. Even I make another curve in the Gaia. That's what I observed. Yeah, I think that's what my experience is also. But I just wanted to know your uh, opinion on that. Because you need uh, sometimes a penetration and torqueability. This situation is very difficult. Like if the still a lady acute curve, there you need penetration, a calcific proximal cap, and this cap you have to puncture. At the same time, you have to make a bend. This situation has to be managed uh, something like that, like this this wire. I am very important. So in that situation, so if one has a bend and one has to penetrate, then I will always lose a dual lumen catheter. That means I will put the main wire into the you know through the central lumen, use the side lumen for my bend with the Gaia because it will limit the amount of curve that one needs to make. Even if one uses a single mm -hmm. lumen micro catheter and makes a curve in the Gaia, when one uses a dual lumen catheter, you are able to position it in such a way that you can get. your dual lumen catheter into a power position and use even that tiny curve of the gaia to try and penetrate sometimes that's not possible because the curve is at the distal end of the cto and you are not able to take your dual lumen catheter up to there that is the only situation in which i will try and use a curve and i don't mind taking a small balloon in the proximal part and dilating it because it gives you a little more um, how do you say leeway for the wire movement at that time and Several times we succeed as long as we are not outside the vessel architecture. It's not recommended. Ah, but exactly. We, you know, you we uh, intentionally do it as the base operation yeah. in uh, area techniques, yes. inducing the dissection and going. That's not good. So sometimes that does help. Your comments, please. Any question? We have Sumit here. Sumit, what are your thoughts, Doctor Smith? Ah, uh, sir, Sumit, Sumit Kumar. Sumit, Smith. Okay. Who oh, is muted? Unmute, please. Hey, good evening, everybody. It was a wonderful lecture. I mean, after that, what the uh, all the discussion. part uh, by dr bali dr guru and dr surya i mean it is all so educating for all of us um, i am i am on uh, i will say on the lowest part of the mountain <laughs> when it comes to cto <laughs> so i would just like to listen uh, my one uh, one query was that sir i am a little bit always afraid of l1 catheter guiding catheters so can you guide us uh, what are the situations based on the anatomy of rca 
uh, or even left main where you straight away start with l1 catheter and do not try jr initially because changing a guide as said is always a difficult thing <laughs> What are those situations on the anatomy basis where you think that AL1 guide should be taken straight away and what precautions should we take when we are using AL1 guide? Because once, well, I was doing RC recently and uh, I hooked the CTO with AL1 guide and uh, unfortunately, right from the tip of the guide, I was in false lumen and the wire was tracking very nicely. I thought it's like I'm going in the true lumen. It's only when I list the distal part and through retrograde injection, the distal cap, at the digital cap, I realized that my wire is not in true lumen. So that thing is uh, <laughs> it's very difficult, very horrible when you take L1 dissection right from the beginning. So I think the support is the key in uh, CPO success. You know, for the right coronary, we prefer uh, amplage catheters. Only the situation is a very short stump, very, very short stump occlusions. It's very difficult, as you know, to engage the amplifiers and keep it there. Uh, I think those situations, as we discussed, the other catheters, including JR, you have to make extra bends and use a micro catheter, you, um, some manipulations we have to use. Otherwise, amplifiers is the, with side holes and to protect the conus and all, and because dampening need not concentrate on those things. So, uh, uh, amplifiers catheter is the ideal situation. Uh, because uh, if your amplage catheter is sitting at the mouth and giving support is always good. If it deeply goes to the CTO segment, uh, there what situation faced? It directly went to the near to the proximal cap, must have injured there. That's why you, you were violated in the false lumen, I think, if I'm correct. Right. So we, we are slightly uh, more aggressive with the amplage. Whenever I have a proximal or a mid RCA, we will always take an unplugged. We, we don't fear it. It's just that, uh, you know, you just have to handle it a little bit carefully. And uh, before injecting, these are just the basic precautions. You know? And don't just push and pull. You can rotate it clockwise and anti-clockwise and find your best as well. And uh, I will reload the micro catheter with a workhorse wire and put in the wire, you know, somewhere close. And then after that, try to hook. And uh, once you're hooked, you have so many options. You look at the pressure carefully, you look at the orientation carefully, you look at the lateral view, you look at the RAO view, to try and make sure that you're somewhere near the Austin. We differ slightly from Surya sir in that we never use side holes. I think uh, it's not really a great option because uh, you know you, you have a feeling you really don't know where you are. And in fact, we actually end up, you end up with more trouble with side holes. At least if you are damping, you know that you should not inject and you are, you know, you have to be very, very careful. If you have side holes, you really ha don't have so much of an idea. Don't worry. The amplage is known to dissect. All of us have done it. I am done. I'm sure everybody who's listening has done it at some time or the other. It happens. It's just a part of the learning curve. And, uh, you know, you, you have to learn to deal with it. Just come things like when you pull it goes in deeper you push it comes out so you push and rotate to hook and de-hook. and uh, always start with a workhorse wire over a micro catheter so you can place the micro catheter in the proximal rca and then start working with whatever wire you want wherever you want as far as the distal rca is concerned when you say that you reach the distal and that is when you looked at the retrograde cap i think that is something that you must look at it's important to use retrograde as far as possible especially a Early in your innings, when you start playing, always play bat and bat close together. No cutting and pulling before you have 25 runs to your game. Second thing, sir, once uh, you have reached the distal lumen and uh, suppose uh, your uh, hardware has perforated the artery, this in the distal true lumen. And at this scenario, because the collaterals are filling it from retrograde injection also, how do you close the perforation? Because just closing it anti won't work because the collaterals are there from retrograde direction also. So how do you tackle a perforation which is there in the distal true lumen caused by the tip of the penetrating wire? So once you have crossed the shaft of CTO and you have reached the distal true lumen and uh, you have perforated there, which is possible. And uh, it, how do you close that situation? Because the distal lumen is being filled retrogradely also. So people who are working retrograde, no, they always have micro catheters and uh, options to close both anti-grade and retrograde. 
So it is not like it is an insurmountable problem and that you cannot close it. But if your wire is in the distal true lumen, it is a, that's what we've been discussing for so long. It's an important thing to try and change it and put a workhouse wire. If your workhouse wire is in the distal true lumen, you can still handle the perforation both anti-grately and retrogradely. However, assuming that you do not have a wire in the retro in the you know in the true distal lumen and you still have a perforation distal, what you said is correct. It has to be closed from both sides, anti-grade and retrograde. Microcatheters can are used to approach retrograde, and like Dr. Surya said, I'm sure he'll touch upon it. The big issue is patient. You must have the epicardial, epicardial collateral. See how to close uh, from both ends, otherwise, they um, continuously use. Absolutely, absolutely. You have to close from both ends. There's no doubt. If you have a distal true lumen perforation or if you have an epicardial vessel perforation, it has to be closed from both ends. Uh, we would have many CTO experts around here in the audience. Maybe uh, Dr. Hajra may be there and uh, Sharad Chandra may be there and other people. Any any comments from the our distinguished uh, colleagues? Sir, there has been a mix-up. Like we had a audience link and a presenter link. I realized late that audience may not be able to join with their video and mic. And just after uh, sir's presentation, I could, you know, display the link for. So maybe many of them are on video. They are watching it, but they are not able to participate. So that is one, and we have, you know, uh, continuous uh, three or four more sessions here on the on a similar topic. Even I have roped in uh, Dr. Balla. I have, I have not, uh, you know, uh, let you, him escape. You get Dr. Balla to present the second uh, talk. Uh, we sir, should, I, I, should, I, I, we, should, we should not leave him. No, sir, I am not leaving him. I have, I have requested him to present. Yes, sir, you to are busy today, so next month you are going to present your talk. His talk would be last uh, tackling complications arising from the CTO treatment. So that would be the difficult part. And, and now, uh, after uh, talking after Dr. Parley and Dr. Sumit, probably another idea has come that we will have one session on where Dr. Parley or Sumit, they can uh, present their CD and we can have a discussion on it because I think that would be more practical uh, because, you know, uh, probably what Dr. Swami or Dr. Rao or yourself would be showing, you know, it would be the, uh, the top plane and what we would require would be uh, just, you know, like Sumit's question was very pertinent that how to hook with M plus or RCA. Uh, uh, what I would suggest is you should have a session on guide wires. You should have a session on guide catheters. And you should have a session on anomalous coronaries and intervention in anomalous coronaries. You know, that is where, you know, most of the common issues arise. And uh, these are the hardware discussion and how to uh, use the guide catheters that would be extremely important and in which uh, situation to use, which guide catheter would be useful. And that is where the intervention actually starts. So I think we should have talks on that. So I'll, I'll again, sir, approach Dr. Swami and uh, yourself. That but you I will, I will keep, on, keep on reminding you till Neeraj uh, presents his. Uh, yeah, the, the, that would be done, sir. That is already, I talked to Dr. Neeraj that he'll be presenting complications how to manage them. And then we'll have one session where people can uh, present their CDs and we can have a discussion. And then we can list out. Uh, like these basic topics, how to choose a guide, how to choose a wire, and because they're really basics, but they are always, you know, perplexing. And uh, we can fix up who can speak because you know it, it's difficult to catch hold of person. Uh, Swami sir, I keep him as a you know stepney. <laughs> so whenever I am, he's our Sachin Tandulkar. So so whenever I am stuck. You know, <laughs> Uh, he's always ready. I can approach him. So I think sir, sir, there sir. was another another suggestion from Dr. Shastri, sir. That now we have so many interventional cardiologists from PGI group. Uh, why don't uh, at least uh, 2025 of us get together to make a registry on different um, topics and uh, with PGI background and with a uh, you know, systematic approach to problem, we would probably create a very huge data bank. Data bank on different uh, subtypes of these diseases, uh, whether they are CPOs or whether they are primary endoplasty or whatever. So why don't we uh, 
look at it, you know, investigator in led some such a registry. You debate about it amongst other people. And uh, let's see what are the problems we anticipate and how we can go about to streamline it and where the uh, minimal industrial support is required to have the data collection. So that would go a long way in making this group a very vibrant group to go for. Yes, sir. So I think, sir, that again, somebody has to take lead there. Uh, if uh, for different, maybe like one can go for a shockwave, one can go for a uh, laser, one can go for uh, CDOs like that. So that can be done, sir. We have uh, almost uh, more than 150 cardiologists in our group, sir. And most of them are now doing interventions. And doing very good work. Yeah, absolutely fantastic. I don't see many of them active here, but in other groups, you find so many PJs doing so well. And I think they should uh, all be together. Strong group, and we should go forward on that. So, sir, thank you. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Surya, pleasure meeting thank you for such a long time. Keep in touch. Nice, uh, nice to see you, sir. God nice bless. To, uh, hearing to you. We'll meet, sir. Good night. So we we'll meet again okay. after a month, sir. Thank That's you. Good night. Good night, sir. Ajay, wonderful talk. Keep it up. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.